I'm especially delighted to welcome Christina today. Um, Christina approached me, I think, about a year ago when she came to a meeting here and she felt inspired to talk. So it's wonderful to see her back here presenting to you all. Um, on the back of that, I'd just like to remind you that we've put out the call for speakers for summer. And I would really, really, really encourage those of you who've been through the mental health system yourself to put yourself forward and present. That's the only way that we bridge the gap between uh, the imagined gap between uh, patient and healer, I believe. So please come. Um, Christina Chen has always been a people person and been fascinated with people's stories and what makes them who they are today. Therefore, it makes sense that for as long as she can remember, Christina has wanted to work in the field of counselling psychology. Christina graduated with distinction, earning a BA of psychology from Simon Fraser University and went on to City University where she completed her Masters of Counselling Psychology, graduating on the Dean's List. Today, Christina is a skilled practitioner who has years of experience with youth and families in both conventional and innovative settings. Her ability to help others comes from her deep conviction and commitment to drawing on her own story and experiences in bringing vulnerability into her practice. Christina is excited today to weave together her lived experience with mental illness and the mental health system as a patient and as a pr practitioner. She's hopeful that her concepts can spur awareness, discussion and ultimately change in how we treat, care for and even approach each other in the world of mental health. Ladies and gentlemen, Christina Chen. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's always weird to hear a whole sentence or paragraph about yourself, um, but I managed to push through that. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, this is a topic that has been my passion for several, several years um, and managed to finally find the courage to share this with you all. Um, okay, so um, my presentation is Tapping into the Gift of the Wounded Healer. And today I'm going to share with you my personal journey to um, my experiences that have really brought me to where I am today and how I practice and work with um, the clients I live out today. But I'm hoping there's implications for everyone, uh, those of you that are practitioners and those of you that are just, just human, so all of you. Okay. So this is my outline. So I'm going to start with a little brief intro of what I'm talking about. Um, and then we'll go into my personal story, which is very much where uh, my passion for this topic and mental health stems from. And then we'll go into a little bit more about what the wounded healer is, in case that was something that was confusing for you. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about what that looks like in my personal life and how I've managed to kind of walk that line and, and live out what I believe to be uh, living out the wounded, the wounded healer. Um, and then I'm going to have some implications for what that might look like for you because it's going to be different for everybody. You know, what works for me and my way of living out the wounded healer and living out vulnerably and courageously will look very different for you. Um, of course, there's another point here. Let's practice. I don't know if that scares any of you. Don't be scared. I won't be asking you to do anything terrifying, but hopefully to step a little bit out of your comfort zone because I couldn't be talking about vulnerability if I wasn't going to ask you to do some of that yourselves. Um, and then I'll have some, conclude, some concluding thoughts, uh, just wrapping it up and going forward. Uh, and lastly, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to ask me some questions or make some comments. All right? So, okay, so this is a quote I really like. Henry Nouwen is a, is a writer that's written a lot about the wounded healer. So if you wanted to look up more literature, Henry Nouwen is a great person to look up. He has a book that's very self-explanatory named The Wounded Healer. So if you wanted to find that, that's available. So we are called to recognize the suffering of our own hearts and make that the starting point of our service. Whether we try to enter into a dislocated world, relate to a convulsive generation, or speak to a dying person, our service will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from a heart 
wounded by the suffering about which we speak. So I really like this quote because it really underlines that in order for us to truly be compassionate to other people, we must know where we are drawing our compassion from. Um, and this is a theme that I'll refer back to several times throughout the, the presentation. Okay, so why this topic? So the reason why I'm so passionate about talking about the wounded healer is because I've experienced serious depression starting from about 2005, so that was my grade 12 year. That was probably my most, one of my most difficult years of my life. At the time, I didn't know that I was depressed. It just kind of looked like a lot of crying for no reason, locking myself up in my closet, um, being really overly stressed about things. And at that time, I had a lot of different things going on in my life, trying to prepare for post-secondary, trying to cope with some changes that were happening in my family, um, not doing well on the basketball team. A lot of different things were adding up to that. And thankfully, I had a very supportive family member, my mother, who recognized it and took me to see my GP. And at that point, I was diagnosed with clinical depression. Um, after... A little while longer, I found after a lot of help, a lot of therapy, I found things were better and I managed to get into SFU. And, but that's kind of around the time that things kind of took a turn for the worst. And I'll tell you a bit more about that um, later, I promise. I'll get back to it. Okay, so um, I wanted to speak to a quote from Yalom that I really qu quite like. Um, so he talks about how everyone and that includes therapists as well as patients, is destined to experience not only the exhilaration of life, but also its inevitable darkness, disillusionment, aging, illness, isolation, loss, meaningless, painful choices, and death. So here I really like that he highlights that nobody is exempt from, from pain and loss in their lives. And I think sometimes as therapists or as clinicians, we often lose sight of that. I find at least I have moments where I'll be sitting across from a client and I'll want to put on my counselor hat and pretend that I'm somehow superhuman or immune to some of these losses because it's a safer place for me to be. But I think something that I've really learned through my personal experience is that that actually acts as a disservice and a barrier between the person I'm sitting across and I. And that we can find more common ground and develop a more meaningful relationship if I speak from the parts of me that I'm afraid to acknowledge or that I'm afraid to go into because I'm relating so closely to my client. So, yeah, I'll explain that more later. Okay, so. In the same way that I believe that therapists have an opportunity to pave the way for our clients, to feel safe, supported, and not alone in sharing their wounds without shame and fear, I view this presentation as an opportunity for me to do the same for you. I hope to model vulnerability, transparency, and to exemplify my vision of the role of the counselor through um, sharing with you my personal experience. So I'm gonna start off with the, the crux of where all this compassion and desire to be vulnerable, be courageous came from. So I'm gonna sh I would like to share with you an excerpt from my thesis. Okay. Okay. So it's July 15, 2009. I'm just going to read this bit. It had been a very long day. I had just come home from another grueling day I had already struggled more than a few times to bring myself to overcome the burden of getting out of bed and continuing on. I was paralyzed by all of the commitments, projects, planning, and work that I had waiting for me. There was so much to be done, but I still found myself completely debilitated. Then came a thought, the only one that had been crystal clear in a long time. I cannot do this anymore. I don't know how I'm going to get out of bed and face my life. I don't think I can. Suddenly, I felt a burst of energy and an overwhelming motivation that I had not felt in months. To roll out of bed, to move forward. I rolled out of bed, put on my shoes, and grabbed my purse. My music, my phone, and paper and pen knowing that I would have things to say to those that I was leaving behind. And so I left. I was a girl on a mission. There were no tears as I sat on the bus heading downtown. I knew it was what I wanted to do. Even more so, I knew it was what I needed to do. 
This was my answer. I was going to handle, this is how I was going to handle my life. The task had become impossible. There was no way that I was going to be able to do everything that I wanted to do in this lifetime, or even to get through the weeks. The task seemed insurmountable. No one could imagine or understand the great heaviness that I felt inside, feeling that in every breath and moment in life, I was falling short of what I wanted so badly to be and achieve as a person. I began to write my note, my apology to those that I loved, for letting them down, for letting myself down, for not being able to find a better way out for not having the strength to continue on like everyone else could. More than anything, I was sorry for having failed them. I reached the foot of the Lions Gate Bridge. It was dark, and the road leading up to the bridge was surrounded by trees and bush. I walked slowly, but with determination and motivation that I had not felt in a long time. I passed a yellow phone on the way up the bridge. A sticker read, if you need help, pick up the phone. Thought, I don't need help. I know what I want to do, and I definitely don't want anyone to stop or talk me out of it. So I continued on to the highest point of the bridge, where I could look out and see the city and the overwhelming darkness. I felt a sense of emptiness and disappointment. There was so much that I wanted to do in this life, but this would be the end of my story. People would remember that I had all these dreams, but I never made it. I couldn't make it happen for myself. I stepped up onto the railing, another step closer. I closed my eyes and imagined what it would feel like to fall. Would I feel anything? Would I feel the impact of the water? At what point would I feel free? All my life, I had been afraid of heights. But in this moment, I felt no fear. I scrolled through my list of songs to the one that I felt most spoke to how I felt at the moment. Fix You by Coldplay. The lyrics resonated so very deeply. When you try your best, but you don't succeed. When you lose something you can't replace. When you love someone, but it goes to waste. Could it be worse? Lights will guide you home and ignite your bones, and I will try to fix you. I had tried. I had done all that I could carry, I could do to carry the burden of my life. I was exhausted. I was out of energy and out of hope. I was broken beyond repair, and no one could understand the pain and weight that I felt on my shoulders. Time passed. I could see cars passing and a couple bikers pass right by me. I wondered if they noticed. If they wondered. I wondered if they even cared. Nobody stopped. I was alone, so isolated. Could they not see me? Maybe they were too scared to know what was going on for me. Maybe they just didn't want to be the one to ask that question. Who was I to them anyway? One step closer. I closed my eyes and willed with every fiber in my body to lean forward and brace myself for the fall. I began to count down slowly in my mind. Five, four, three, and with each number, flashes of lifelong dreams precious moments with family, images of my loved ones learning the news. Two, thought. Is this what you want? Is this truly how you imagined your life playing out? 
Is this really how you want it to end? How you want to be remembered? Then, in a moment of grace, a voice in my head, not my own. If there is even a bit of doubt, then this is not the thing to do, because this decision is not reversible. I reached for my phone and observed myself dial the numbers 911. A rush of mixed feelings swirled within me. Confusion, anger, sadness, hopelessness, emptiness, self-hatred, and worthlessness. The phone began to ring. I felt pathetic. I couldn't even execute the one plan that I felt motivated about. Why did I lack the courage? Why did I lack conviction? The dispatcher answered, and so began the mental warfare within my mind. For what felt like hours, I wrestled with the two sides of myself, the one that wanted to give myself another chance at life, and the one that kept driving me to the edge. I alternated between moments of openness and softness with the dispatcher, sharing my struggle and moments of resistance. Non-responsiveness and avoidance of her to attempt to gauge, engage with me. Overwhelmed and confused, I took a step down. It all happened so fast, and to this day, I'm still not sure what gave my location away. Before I knew it, the familiar blinding red and blue lights flashed brightly behind me. A firm and commanding voice, yet not intimidating or harsh, asked me to step off and back from the railing. He advanced and explained that he just wanted to have a conversation. I said nothing and still clung to the railing, staring out towards the water. This was my last chance. He advanced closer, asked me to step down so that we could talk about what was going on for me. Next thing I knew, I had somehow stepped into the back of his car, shaking from the cold and the overwhelming emotions I was feeling having come so close to an ending. I was fragile. He was kind and warm and understanding. He listened carefully and related his own experiences with difficult times in his life. I felt understood and less alone in this life. He didn't think I was crazy. He remembered that he too had felt overwhelmed before. We talked about life and how he had coped with times of sadness and hardship in the past. We shared life. His willingness to share openly and connect with me calmed me as we drove to Lionsgate Hospital for a checkup before he could take me home, he said. I felt a sense of safety with him. He cared that I lived. At the hospital, the officer offered to wait in the emergency with me. I began to feel anxious. How would I be viewed? Would they think I was crazy? My name was called and I was brought into a room, essentially a hospital bed surrounded by equipment and sectioned off by a white curtain. I waited anxiously. At this time, a nurse abruptly entered, eyes glued to a chart, asking what seemed to be the problem tonight. I sheepish, sheepishly and fearfully tried to explain that I was having a hard time with some of the things that were going on in my life. I allowed my voice to trail off as I noticed her feverishly taking notes without making eye contact. Aha, uh -huh, she nodded. Where were you? She asked. I answered. More notes. I immediately felt small. She didn't want to know my story. She didn't care to know me. A few more demographic questions and she leaves. I can see her shoes walk up to the officer waiting outside of my room. They engage in some conversation that I can't make out. More minutes pass. What's going on for you tonight? 
asked the doctor. Filled now with shame and anxiety surrounding the ambiguity of the situation, I try to explain myself again. Were you thinking of killing yourself tonight? He interjects. I, I was thinking, but then I wasn't sure. I just need to talk to someone at home. Can I just go home? I ask. I wanted comfort. I wanted safety. I wanted to hear the voice of someone who was happy that I had chosen to live. Mm-hmm. Just wait a second, Christina. More minutes pass, and I can see the gap from the curtain in the floor that the doctor, nurse, and officer are having a conversation outside my room. I can hardly breathe from the confusion and fear and anxiety building up within me. Wasn't it a good thing that I called 911? The doctor and nurse re-entered. We can't let you go, Christina. The psychiatrist isn't in until the morning, so we've decided to keep you here. I panicked. Where? Here? But I don't want to stay here. I just want to go home and see my family. I just want to talk to someone. You're not in the right mind to make that decision for yourself, Christina. You're going to stay here in the psych ward. I was frantic. I couldn't breathe. I began trembling again. Tears rolled down my cheeks as I called for the officer to help me, but it was out of his control. I had to stay. The doctor explained, just breathe. The nurse will be back with a hospital gown for you to change into. Somebody explained to them that I was just having a bad day and that I'm just scared and I want to be consoled. I want to be cared for. Someone explained to them who I am, that I am safe with myself, that I just need a warm, human, and loving conversation. I called my mom in tears. Tell them I'm not crazy. Come get me. I don't want to stay here. I'm scared. They don't care about what I want or what I need. They're making me stay. My mom responded in desperation. I'm on my way, Christina. I'm going to do everything I can to take you home. The nurse returned with a wheelchair. I wanted to walk on my own. I wasn't sick. There was nothing wrong with me. But she explained firmly that walking was not an option. I explained that my, nurse, my mom was a nurse and she was coming to take me home. She explained that she would contact my mother again and let her know that I would have to be, I would have to at the very least stay the night and that I would no longer be able to maintain possession of my phone. She removed my belongings, my clothing, my jewelry, hairpins, cell phone, and identification. I was stripped down. I had no identity. I had no rights. Still quivering in fear and panic, she rolled me down the hallways, farther and farther from the bright lights of the emergency room. No words were exchanged. We began to slow down in a corridor where I noticed bars over the windows and caging over the doors. I felt like I had entered some sort of horror movie. I felt like a criminal. I felt out of my mind. But I wasn't crazy. I was just fragile. I was broken. I was having a moment of weakness. She rolled me into a room of three beds separated by a familiar white curtain. This would be my bed tonight. I was terrified. She handed me three small pills and asked me to take them, explaining that they would calm me and help me sleep. I inquired and refused, but she insisted. I was powerless. I had made a huge mistake. I should have never called. That night, I cried myself to sleep, cold, frightened, and alone. The next 24 hours seemed like a blur. Every minute of my day was dictated by a predetermined schedule of meals, 
pre-planned activities and checkups. I remember asking for my clothes back, declined. Asking for my phone back, declined. Asking to use the computer, declined. Asking to sit outside in the gated off garden, also declined. It was explained to me that these were all privileges and I had to earn them through good behavior. I broke down more than a few times and asked several times to speak with a counselor or a psychiatrist. I wanted to be supported. I wanted to be heard. I didn't belong here. The answer was the same every time. Not yet. Still no visitors allowed. Hours upon hours passed. Sometimes I would sit in silence, facing the wall, watching as the seconds passed. I was convinced that all I needed to see was a counselor or a doctor to prove that I was no longer at risk to myself. Each time I made a request to see the doctor, my request was declined. It wasn't my time yet, so I waited. Inside, I felt that in every moment of captivity, I was fighting for my sanity. I recall a particularly disheartening moment when I asked to go to the washroom to wash my face, feeling sterile, dirty, and disheveled. I recall looking in the mirror at this pale girl, stripped of her identity, lost, broken, worn down, frail, confused, and forgotten. I did not recognize her. There were no signs of life or spirit. I remember weeping in sadness and self-pity. In here, it didn't matter that I might have a bright future. It didn't matter that I had a loving family and caring friends that I knew wanted to be by my side right now. I was just another patient, waiting to earn the right to live, to regain my identity. I found myself alternating between moments of hopelessness and numbness and moments of anger at the system. How did they know that I still belonged here if no one had checked in with me since I had been brought here? Where was the care? Wasn't I supposed to be safer here than on the bridge? For some reason, I felt more at risk in my mind. Waiting and waiting to talk to someone, to sit down with someone who could help restore me, help me find a reason to go on. Someone to believe in me, but there was no one. Night came and I was told that I would finally have a sit down with a nurse to check in with my progress. I was hopeful. I had so much to say about the bridge, about the hopelessness and despair, about how I had made the call to give myself another chance at life. I wanted to feel heard. I wanted to be consoled. I had waited all night and day to speak to someone, to experience care. I would tell the nurse of my dreams, of the pressures of my life, of my family history and my history of depression. She would listen. I would be seen. There would be hope. I waited nervously at the appointed meeting spot in the common area for the nurse to visit with me. She arrived abruptly mid-conversation with another nurse regarding the medication for another patient. In her hands, a chart with my name printed on the side. Notes had been written, but I could not see what had been noted. I was surprised there had been any notes, considering no one had taken the time to speak with me yet. She asked, so what's going on, Christina? Why were you admitted last night? I was taken aback by her sharpness. I began to tell her my story, the pressures in my life, feeling stress from school, finances, family. She jumped in quickly to conclu conclude, well, isn't it obvious? You have taken on too much. She proceeded to ask me questions about I was, why I was stressed about finances for school. Since she had been an academic advisor previously and aware of the copious amounts of funding for students that remained unused by students because they failed to apply. Her next set of questions focused on my coping skills and future plans surrounding how I would carry on following this breakdown, or as she called it, the incident. 
Ten minutes later, she notified me that time was up and it was time for bed. I would be scheduled to meet with the doctor eventually. I was devastated and dispirited. Could she not relate? Did my story not evoke any emotion or compassion within her? That night, on the only paper I could find, I wrote, After talking to the nurse, I felt broken and weak. I felt stupid. Just listening to myself not being able to answer her question about the future. Because that's my problem. I haven't decided what to do in the future. Perhaps too many people have come through here. So many that the workers have hardened and have gotten used to a certain type of patient. There seems to be no range of care provided in the psych ward depending on circumstances. They might know of my fragility, but if they had stopped to check in, it would have made all the difference. I felt unintelligible, lost and confused. I hate being here. I feel overlooked, invisible and dehumanized. This experience marks the beginning of a vision for a different approach to clients, stemming from my own personal experience as a patient. One that encompasses and acknowledges the client's woundedness and offers mental health professionals the opportunity to join with their clients in a way that I believe to be therapeutic work and that is truly human-centered. Therapy that is centered around what it means to be human and to connect to another human being. Embracing both ours, the counselors, and the client's flawedness, vulnerabilities, insecurities, fears, and anxieties, and wounds as an integral part of the therapeutic process. That was just my story, that part. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. So as you can see, it's definitely a, it's been a frightening and long journey being able to work my, my way back to be here to present with you at Lionsgate Hospital. Um, the psych ward that I was hospitalized in is not the Hope Center, but A2, um, a rather dreary, if I may say, dark building behind us uh, that I had the haunting experience of walking by on my way to the first meeting that I came to here. Um, things are different now, thankfully. but. Um, it's always been um, a humbling, frightening, and gratifying experience any time that I, that I take the bus over the Lionsgate Bridge. I was fortunate enough in the past year to land a job at a local high school on the North Shore, but before then I had avoided the North Shore like a plague just in fear of remembering many of these memories um, and feeling so dehumanized by a system that I felt I, I had wanted to become a part of. But I felt like if I was going to be a part of this system that I, I wanted to stand for something different. And I wanted to make sure that if I ever lived past that moment in A2 that I could do my part in making sure that the same experience wouldn't happen to somebody else. So if I can get my presentation back. So, let's take you out of there for a second um, in the heat of my story. So, what is a wounded healer? Okay. So, the original concepts of a wounded healer uh, was developed um, as an archetype um, by Carl Jung back in 1963. And the two names that he had for the counselor and the counselee were the analyst and the analyst. Analyst and I'm going to say it wrong. I apologize. Don't quote me on that. Um, so it talks about how they form a unique relationship where their where their wounds consciously and unconsciously affect the wounds of the client and the counselor. So talking just about this subconscious relationship that forms between the counselor and the um, client. Now um, I was also able to find in ancient times. Um, different cultures, a lot of times the ancient healers were known to use their own wounds to develop treats and cures. So this is more for physical pain, but for to based on their own suffering and illness. So the concept is that if you hadn't gone through it, if you hadn't been able to heal your own physical wounds, you would have no idea about how to help someone else do the same. So that's just in a very original sense. And then Henry Nouwen, as I spoke about, um, has also spoken about the wounded healer um, and another 
quote that I quite like from him is that he talks about how woundedness is a necessary part of being human and about being compassionate. And he said, it is only through a deeper understanding and an acceptance of ourselves and our own wounds that we are able to make our wounds available as a source of healing for others. So this is just kind of where the original concepts of um, the wounded healer stem from. So, um, oh, where am I? Okay, so a couple questions that I found myself asking um, was, could it be that an acknowledgement and recognition of a counselor's own wounds makes them more credible as a healer for wounds for others? So, where did this? So, the, I, what I've noticed in the literature when I was looking back is that there was this, a lot of literature around the wounded healer and it kind of disappeared for a part. And when I was looking into it, I noticed a lot of, different articles speaking about the difficulty of being a wounded healer or for clinicians to be in touch with their wounds is that they fear seeming less credible, right? So they fear that if they're sitting across from their client and they share that they've also been through depression or if they hold that in their heart sitting across from a client that they may also feel less competent. And I've experienced this myself, of course, going through this journey of figuring out what being a wounded healer looks like for me. Um, but it's definitely been a struggle and I found that it's been a lot more rewarding and I've been a much more able to create a stronger bond with my clients when I hold this awareness of my own wound. Um, it, it really brings a lot of humility to me as I sit across from a client and I recognize that I too am human and that I know, yes, perhaps I've gone to school and I've acquired a degree and I've learned some different techniques, but at the heart of it, I've also experienced pain. And that in that way, it makes me no better than the person I'm sitting across from. We are human. So in a study in 2011, Martin examined, he took actually a bunch of therapists and he looked into how uh, therapists use this. And he found that a lot of therapists were in fear of sharing their own personal experiences because they were afraid that they would be judged. Uh, they were afraid that the client, or perhaps if it was a youth, the client's parent might think somehow, oh, how can you help my son or daughter through this if you too have been through it? However, in the study by Martin, um, after all the interviews, they were able to find that therapists that were able to embrace and hold on to the fact that they had been through really difficult experiences were much more able to connect with their clients. That clients felt much more connected and they felt much more seen as a human being. Uh, Martin later on quoted that we often lose sight of the functionality of our wound and in the end um, of perspective, which breeds perspective. So he was talking a lot about how sometimes cl as clinicians our focus on you know, what technique we're using or you know, what type of therapy we're using can make us lose sight of this person that we have in front of us and the basis of uh, compassion and being with another human being. Um, yeah, so that was Martin. Uh, there was also a literature, literature review done by a gentleman named Chanel. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. But he was talking about how over time there's been a false belief of therapists as a superhuman. That was his quote. Um, he said that somehow there's become this misconception that therapists are somehow exempt from adversity and pain in their own lives which of course we're not, everybody knows the stats, one in five are affected by mental illness and us clinicians are no exception. Um, and I have found over the time that I've delved into the wounded healer and my research around it, that I have met more and more clinicians that allude to having personal experiences, either themselves or someone very close to them that they loved, that drives their passion for helping other people. But I started to wonder then why don't we talk about this? Why has this become a hidden secret? Why is it that we, some of us, still try to pretend that we have it together when we're sitting across from a client in fear that they may judge us? So I started to ask the questions, what is the effect of an acknowledgement, acceptance, and integration of woundedness into the therapeutic practice? All right. Oh yes, so this is, I forgot about this slide, but this is a summary of what I just said. <laughs> Um, okay, um, okay. So the last, the last, um, the last study that I want to mention to you was by Bitter and Bird 
in 2011, and it was talking about the therapist's use of self in therapy. So for some people, they often think that I'm talking about self-disclosure. I'm not. Um, I'm talking about the ability to hold on to where your compassion stems from. Um, once again, where the wound that you draw your compassion from. And this applies to both clinicians and anyone, just people in, in general. When you're working, when you want to connect with someone, whether it be a friend, a family member, um, a colleague, holding on to what makes you human, the essence of what makes you human, the pain that you've been through, the woundedness that you've been through when you're relating with that person makes such a difference. Even if I don't sit across from my client and tell them, I too have been through depression. I am aware of my wound. I'm aware of what makes me human and that we're, we've experienced the same things. So for this particular one in Bitter and Bird, so they also did a study about the use of self in, in the therapy room, and they found that therapists who perhaps self-disclosed or just chose to be aware of certain experiences that they'd had in their life, or they, also, they called it self-involvement, so just being a little bit more revealing in the room as a therapist, not being that blank slate that we've heard about. Um, it led to more effective joining, mutual respect, normalization of the client, and humanization of the therapist. So clients were able to see their therapist as a fellow human being, not the expert that some of us, even I, I'll speak to that, sometimes even I want to hide behind the expert because I fear that the client might be thinking, well, what, what do you know if you've been in the same place as me? But, but I, I think it's really important that we work our way out of that, that mold of us as the ever professional, ever knowing um, expert. So in the end, it created a more egalitarian relationship between the therapist and the client, which I believe we should all be working towards um, and makes a huge difference in the counselor room. Um, both as a counselor, and I've experienced that as a client as well, going to therapy, feeling like the therapists that I've chosen to continue to work with um, are ones that are more self-revealing, that I don't believe hide behind, um, hide behind the misconception that they've somehow not experienced anything in their lives. I have more respect for them as a person. I feel like I can be more vulnerable because they're willing to be vulnerable and sit with their wounds in the room. So by working and living with this attitude, we can show what being mentally healthy really looks like. It is not about being unaffected or perfect without flaws or triggers, making it through life without wounds, hurts, or scars. We all have our wounds. Being mentally healthy is about being resilient and courageous, embracing all of our wounds as an integral part of your humanness. It is about being a version of the self that does not feel shame of our wounds and feels no need to hide them. So this speaks for me a lot about modeling. So if we are able to do that in our own lives where we can model, where we can model being authentic, being vulnerable in our own lives, whether in the counseling room or not, just even amongst colleagues or friends, if we can model that, we can start to make a difference in, in our communities, but specifically also in the world of mental health. Um, Yeah, so another, another quote from Yalom is he talks a lot about the client and the therapist being fellow tri travelers walking alongside each other through some of the really difficult times in life and acknowledging struggles and being aware of that. So once again, bringing back to that egalitarian relationship uh, that I think is really essential in the therapeutic room. So, um, so the next step of where this ta has taken me is asking questions around what is the actual role of the counselor then? Okay, is it when we're just in the room sitting across from our clients? Is that, is that the end of our responsibility? And for some of us, it may be. You know, I, I don't want to sound like what, right, what is right for me is right for you, but these are the questions I started to ask myself. I started to wonder about what advocating for our clients would look like and how perhaps we as mental health professionals could do more for our clients and the world that they live in, the world we live in together. So I started asking, what if we as counselors were the ones to shed more light and invite others into these unashamed conversations surrounding mental health and illness, challenging misconceptions and normalizing mental illness and woundedness? Can our care for our clients extend outside of the counseling room? Also wanting to ask, what role can we play in changing the societal views of mental health and illness? What is our responsibility? 
I recall a conversation, I, um, not a conversation, uh, one of my profs at City U when I was doing my master's, and he was speaking about why, he was asking the question of why is it that the government likes to make, I know, sorry, politics, but it's not very politic, don't worry, don't worry, just, 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 just feel me out here. Okay, so um, he was talking about why the government likes to make cuts from people such as people that are disabled or the young people in the world, right, like children or adolescents. We had no answers. <laughs> uh, I think he just threw us off, so we had, I had nothing to say, no idea. And he proceeded to explain that it's because if the government makes cuts from groups like nurses or teachers, they're able to organize themselves in a way where they can have a huge stand or a picket line or a con some sort of petition going around, and they can organize themselves to make a stand, right? to make a statement. I don't know whether or not this is true, it just was thought provoking for me. But he said the difference about between that and those that are marginalized in our society, those struggling with addictions, those struggling with mental illness, those struggling with even just the youth and children and adolescents in our, in, in our communities, they aren't able to do that. So it's easier to take from them. I was shocked by this, this disclosure and this sharing by him. Once again, like I said, I don't know if it's true, but it definitely made me think. It made me think about what is my responsibility to the individual sitting across from me? If they are not in a place to advocate for themselves, then whose responsibility is that? And could that be mine? Could that be ours? You know, if every counselor who either was touched personally by mental illness or knows of somebody who was touched by mental illness began to speak openly in conversations about mental illness, perhaps we could change the lives of our clients that sit across from us. Perhaps they wouldn't fear, feel so much stigma and shame coming to our offices to talk about what's going on in their lives because we would have slowly made those differences in conversations in their community. And it doesn't have to be a mental illness. It doesn't have to be about mental illness. It can just be about you being more vulnerable in your conversations day to day. You know, when someone asks, how are you doing today? My favorite is to challenge people and force them to give me a different word besides fine, good, or interesting. Some of you in this room might have experienced that. I can think of at least one that I wouldn't let them walk away from me until they gave me a better word. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I just, I think that we, that, that in its simplest form is also us practicing being vulnerable, letting each other be seen. And in those ways we can start to be proactive in having open conversations about what's actually happening in our lives. Because I think a lot of us have gotten really disconnected where we don't have those conversations about what's really happening um, inside for us, um, which farther down the road can lead to mental illness and isolation. All right, so you might still be thinking, this sounds really great, but what does this actually look like in practice? So as I mentioned before, it might look, it'll look different for each person. So I'll just start with this quote. Making one's own wounds a source of healing, therefore does not call for a sharing of superficial personal pains, but for a constant willingness to see one's own pain and suffering as rising from the depth of the human condition that we share. So once again, back to that humility back to that part that makes us human. Being in touch with our woundedness is actually what makes us more connected and similar to our clients than we'd sometimes like to think. Oh my goodness, time. Okay. Um, all right. So, I just realized the time. Okay, so I've gone about expressing and sharing my woundedness in a variety of ways. One of the ways which I've done this is through testimonials, such as speaking engagements like this and speaking engagements at my church and at a few different events. Um, every time that I do it, it scares me. I can't tell you the process that I went through last night. I had moments where I was like, why did I do this? There are definitely a few people that receive messages like, I'm freaking out. I don't know why I chose to be so vulnerable. This is terrifying. I don't want anyone to see me. This is ter I think I just asked um, Dr. Dr. Chakraborty if I could just sit in fetal position in the corner. <laughs> Real thought, That's, that really happened. Um, it's scary, it's really, really scary to be vulnerable and let yourself be seen. But I think the part that reminded me or the part that brought me peace is when I often thought about some of the, the clients that I've worked with or some of the youth that I've worked with and how much more terrifying it must be for them to be vulnerable. Um, not having been or know, know anything about the system, not having been through the system, being lost in, in their own struggle 
And, and that's where I drew strength from, knowing that maybe I could make a difference. So testimonials is one of the ways. Um, did you want to speak? Um, I feel like I have so much more to say, but I think that's just speaker problems. Sorry about that. I don't need that one. <laughs> just going to cut it. Um, OK. Did you, did you want to speak about the time? Are you just OK? OK. OK. Um, so another way that I've done this is through social media. So um, about uh, five years after the time, so after 2009, so after my incident on the bridge, I really got to a place of healing where I was like, okay, this has happened to me, and I don't want it to just be a story of how it's happened to me. I want to make a difference. I remember feeling so alone and depressed. And then I remember coming out of my depression, learning about it in, in grad school and, and in my degree, in my bachelor's, and thinking to myself, if this happens to that many people, if that many people struggle with depression, why the heck did I feel so alone when I was going through it? And I realized it's because I didn't really know anybody that was talking about it. I didn't know anybody that even mentioned that they weren't good when I asked them how they were. I didn't know anyone that didn't, that didn't express to me that they were having a hard time. And so I decided that, since social media is so big right now, if you can't beat them, join them, um, I started to use social media to um, break down the stigma to the best of my ability. So I wanted to model vulnerability and authenticity. I wanted to be congruent. I don't know if any of you have Facebook, but um, I definitely have friends on Facebook that aren't my actual friends. I won't tell you who, but they're just acquaintances, people that I've met. I've got like some, whatever. I don't, I'm not gonna tell you the number. I just have a lot of people. And I was thinking to myself, well, if everyone, if out of all those people, even just one person read my post, perhaps they would find some hope. Perhaps they wouldn't feel alone. Perhaps they would, that would break down the barrier and open up a line of communication where they might just reach out to me. So I tried it. Also very terrified. So nervously, on July 15, 2013, four years following the night of my, uh, my incident at the bridge, I posted, this, I posted this on my wall if it would come up. Oh no, it's not going to come up. Okay, technical difficulty. Um, basically, I posted a, um, a, a picture of a man and said, the bravest thing I've ever done uh, was to decide, I'm probably going to butcher it, was to decide to continue on when I thought that the only option was the end. And underneath it, I wrote my story. I wrote about how in 2009, I was standing on a bridge and that I was thinking about killing myself and that depression is scary and that it happens to a lot of us and that we don't talk about it and that stigma and shame keeps us quiet. But I want to break that and I want to talk about it. And if you or if anyone you know has struggled with it, feel free to leave a message, to send me a post, or just sit in quietness knowing that someone else has gone through it. I didn't know what was going to happen with that. I, I didn't think much of it. Um, I was nervous, definitely checked my post often. But before I knew it, it kind of just, I had many, many responses, um, many likes, that doesn't count, um, but a lot of comments. <laughs> Um, to my joy, I had four people respond to me uh, through personal messages, uh, two of which let me know that they were currently going through depression and that it meant a lot to them, that, um, that somebody else was going through it and willing to talk about it, and another two that were just asking about resources for their friend or their parent. But to me, that was enough. That was more than enough and that I was making a difference. And so since then, I've continued to do that. I've made several posts, including the one about this this presentation today, which has sparked a lot of conversation for me. Um, just yesterday, I was sitting at lunch with a friend of mine. I work with her son, uh, who's autistic, and we were, we were just having lunch. And out of nowhere, she said, I didn't know that you went through this. I'm just like trying to pick up rice and eat my chicken teriyaki and focus. And she's just like, I didn't, I didn't know. And I said, right. And then I realized that moment I was trying to wrestle between whether I wanted to be vulnerable and honest and congruent or if I wanted to choose what I know would be safer, which would be to say, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that right now. But I decided that this is an important time, that this is what I wanted. I wanted people to ask me. I wanted people to talk to me. I wanted people to talk with me about it so that perhaps they could go on and talk to someone else. So I shared. I shared my story. We were in this little Korean restaurant, and I shared my story about being on the bridge, about depression, about my struggles, and why it felt so right for me to speak 
give this talk, even though it scares me so much. Um, but that's, that's the point of my, of this is the passion behind my project. So um, last thing, of course, is embracing woundedness through conversations. So that would be an example of that. Times where I've noticed that I'm sitting across from my youth or my colleagues, and they ask me, what got you into this work? And I have the choice between saying, I just want to help people, or saying and admitting that it's because I have a personal experience that, with depression. And I remember how hard it was. And I remember how scary it was and how alone I felt. And, and that's why I'm doing it. And I think we, we are presented in life with these options every day, whether you're a clinician or not, about how vulnerable we want to be. But I, I want to draw that parallel with the extent to which you decide to be open and honest about what you've been through in your life. Because I know we all have been through them, no matter what you tell me. Um, that if we, you could use that to connect to your fellow human beings, fellow people in your life, the people you care about, or people that you meet on the street, and that could make the difference. That could be the conversation. Perhaps you would have less stories of the man that committed suicide and everyone thought was really happy, but he didn't have a chance to talk to anyone about it, because no one really asked him, or no one was really vulnerable about their own experiences, so he didn't feel like it was a safe world to express pain or woundedness. Okay. Okay. So as I mentioned before, for me, being in touch with my own woundedness has been an ongoing process. It's taken a lot of time. I still struggle with it. There's a lot of moments sometimes where I'll be like, why am I doing this? Or how honest can I be? I know about three weeks ago I was having a hard time and at work I had a youth come into my, my office and um, I met with her a couple times already. I mean, she's a regular. So she came in and she was like, how are you? I was like, good. And she was like, really? And I was like, I'm OK. And I noticed that just making that difference and admitting that I was just OK, I felt like she connected with me. She knew that I had revealed. I didn't go into my whole story of the bridge or break into you know, reading out my thesis to her. But I, I know that in that moment, she knew that we were both humans in that time. We were both equals in that moment. Um, and as, we, as, I, as the session continued on, I noticed that instead of me making statements like, you know how some people da 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 da, or you know how, you know, or when in life you feel like this, I noticed that I changed it to we. I said, when in life when we struggle with things, because it was more congruent, it was more authentic. Who was I to pretend like I hadn't been through anything while she was being so brave and vulnerable to sit across from me and share those things? So once again, I want to emphasize it'll look different for everyone, um, being a wounded healer. And perhaps for you, it's not going to be public speaking or social media posts, or perhaps for you, it will. But I'd like to challenge you to do that. Um, unfortunately, I had this fantastic idea of having um, you practice with each other. But maybe too much of your excitement, I won't make it there. <laughs> Yeah, so, but these are some things for you to consider in conversations um, with future colleagues. What wound do you draw your compassion for others from? Um, and just think about being more vulnerable. I, I, I really think yeah. we should stop. Yeah. I'm terribly sorry. No, no, that's okay. Go on. That was stunning. Thank and you. And really courageous. Thank you. Thank you.